API stands for Application Programming Interface, which defines how software components should interact with each other. Let's say on one side you have the client, which is either the mobile phone or the browser of this user. And on the other side you have the server, which will be responding to the requests. So API here is just a contract that defines these terms, which are what requests can be made. So it provides us with an interface on how to make these requests, meaning what endpoints do we have, what methods can we use, and so on. Also, what responses can we expect from this server for a specific endpoint? So first of all, it is an abstraction mechanism because it hides the implementation details while exposing the functionality. For example, we can make a request to save a user data in this server, but we don't care at all about how the logic applies behind the scenes inside of this server. So we only care about the interface that is provided through this API. And we only use that endpoint and we store the user without even knowing about the implementation details. And it also sets the service boundaries because it defines clear interfaces between systems and components. So this allows us to have multiple servers. We can have one server that is responsible for managing the users. We can have another one that is responsible for some other records, let's say for managing the posts and so on. So this allows different systems to communicate regardless of their underlying implementation, like client browsers with servers or servers with another servers and so on. Now let's focus on the most important API styles you will encounter during the design phase. These are RESTful, GraphQL and gRPC. The most common one out of these is REST, which stands for Representational State Transfer. These type of APIs use resource-based approach by using the HTTP methods as a protocol. One of the advantages of REST APIs is that they are stateless, meaning that each request contains all of the information needed to process it, and we don't need any prior requests to be able to process the current request. And it uses the standard methods on HTTP protocol, which are GET for fetching data, POST for storing data, PUT or PATCH for updating data, and DELETE for deleting data. So based on its characteristics, the REST is most commonly used in web and mobile applications. Next we have GraphQL, which is the second most common API style after the REST APIs. GraphQL is a query language that allows clients to request exactly what they need. This means that it comes with a single endpoint for all of the operations and we can choose what we are expecting to receive from this API by providing the payload in the request. And the operations here are called query whenever we are retrieving data or mutation whenever we are updating data. So this is the equivalent in put or patch or post in the RESTful APIs. And there is also a subscription in operations, which is for real-time communication. The advantage of GraphQL APIs is that it allows us to have minimal round trips. Let's say we need some data that in RESTful APIs we will need to make free requests to get all of this data. In GraphQL case, we can make a single request and get all of this data, avoiding the unnecessary two requests that we will otherwise have to make in RESTful. And because of that, this is the recommended option for complex UIs. So wherever you have some complex UIs where on one page you might need different data, on another page you might need some other complex nested data. In these cases, GraphQL is the better choice over RESTful APIs. And the last option is gRPC. I would say this is the least common one out of these three. gRPC is a high performance RPC framework, which is using protocol buffers for communication. The methods in gRPC are defined as RPCs in the proto files, and it supports streaming and bidirectional communication. This is an excellent approach for microservices especially, and internal system communication, as it is more efficient when you're working between servers compared to GraphQL or compared to RESTful APIs. So the difference between REST, GraphQL and gRPC APIs is kind of clear, but let's also clarify the real difference between REST and GraphQL APIs on examples. So as you saw, REST comes with resource-based endpoints. For example, here, if we take a look at these requests, you can see that the resource here is users. So you always expect to see some users endpoint or some followers endpoint or let's say posts endpoint. So it is resource-based. 
and sometimes we might need to make multiple requests for getting the related data as you can see here we need let's say the user details but we also need the user posts and followers so in this case we need to make free requests to get all of these data and it uses HTTP methods to define operations. As you can see, these are HTTP endpoints and we are using the get method specifically. And the response structures are fixed, meaning if you got one response for this specific user, next time you can expect to have exactly the same response structure. Maybe some data will be modified, but the structure always remains the same. And it also provides explicit versioning, so as you can see it comes with v1 for the v1 API, then later if it got a major upgrade then this will become v2 and so on. And you can use the headers on the requests to leverage the HTTP caching on RESTful APIs. Now if we compare that to GraphQL APIs, it comes with a single endpoint for all operations, so mostly it is slash GraphQL or slash some API endpoint that is commonly used for all operations and in this case we will use a single request to get the precise data that we need and we will use the query language of GraphQL. This is what the query language looks like. As you can see we start with a query and then we define what we need. For example we need the user with ID 123. Then we need the name of the user, the posts and then we define whatever we need from the posts. Maybe we need only title and content and nothing more and also the followers and what we need from followers, maybe only names. So this allows us to be more efficient in our requests compared to RESTful APIs where we will need to make free requests for this same data. This means that client needs to specify the response structure and in this case the schema evolution is without versioning. So here as you saw it is with v1, v2 and so on. In this case, the schema usually evolves without versioning, but there is also a common pattern to start versioning the fields. For example, you can have followers v2, and that will be the second type of followers schema. But you can also go without versioning, so you can just start modifying the followers or posts if you are sure that there are no other clients using your old API. And in this case, you can leverage the application level caching instead of the HTTP caching. Now, each of these APIs use different protocols, and we will learn more about these in the next lesson. But basically, your protocol choice will fundamentally shape your API design options. For example, the features of HTTP protocol directly enable RESTful capabilities. So it makes more sense to use HTTP along with RESTful APIs because it also provides you with status codes and these are great to be used with CRUD operations that you will have in RESTful APIs. On the other hand, WebSockets, which is another type of protocol, enable real-time data. So this can be used along with real-time APIs wherever you need some chat application or some video streaming. This is a good use case of WebSocket APIs. In case of GraphQL APIs, you again will use the HTTP protocol instead of WebSockets or gRPC. gRPC, on the other hand, can be used among with microservices in your architecture to make it faster compared to HTTP. So your protocol choice will affect the API structure and also the performance and capabilities. Therefore, you should choose it based on its limitations and strengths and the one that makes more sense in the type of API that you'll be developing. Now let's discuss the API design process. It all starts with understanding the requirements, which is identifying core use cases and user stories that you will need to develop. Also defining the scope and boundaries, because if it's a huge API, then you probably won't develop all of the features at once. So you should scope it to some specific features that you'll be developing and also what are out of scope for now. Then you should determine the performance requirements and specifically in your API case, what will be the bottlenecks and where you need to make sure that it's performant. And you should also not overlook the security constraints, so you should implement all of the basic features like authentication, authorization, the rate limiting, but maybe some more stuff depending on the API that you'll develop. When it comes to design approaches, there are a couple of ways to go about it. The first one is top-down approach, which is you start with high-level requirements and workflows. 
This is more common in interviews where they give you the requirements on what the API will be about and then you start defining what the endpoints will be, what the operations will be and so on. But there is also the bottom-up approach, which is if you have existing data models and capabilities, then you should design the API based on this. So this is more common when you're working in a company and they already have their data models and capabilities of their APIs. So you should take that into account when designing the API. And we also have contract first approach, which is you define the API contract before implementation, meaning what the requests should look like and what the responses should look like. And this is more similar to top down approach. And this is also commonly used in interviews. When it comes to lifecycle management of APIs, it starts with the design phase where you design the API, discuss the requirements and the expected outcomes of the API. And only after that you can start the development and maybe local testing of your API. After that you usually deploy and monitor it so you do some more testing but now on staging or on production. But then it also comes the maintenance phase and this is why it's important to develop it with keeping the simplicity in place so it will be easier for you to maintain or for other developers to maintain in the future. And lastly, APIs also go through deprecation and retirement phase. So some APIs eventually get deprecated because there might come up a new version of the API that you should use or let's say you are transitioning from V1 to V2 API. So that's also the deprecation phase of the V1 API. So developing APIs is not only in the development phase, as you might assume, it's not just coding. So the big part of it is designing it and also keeping it maintainable and also eventually you might need to retire it at the end.